So, Ray, thank you for uh, allowing me to see you at the exhibit today. Can you tell me uh, whatever you'd like to tell me about some of your paintings? Well, it's an, it's an honor to get this group of paintings um, visualized because a, a painter is a painter because of, of the uh, response to the spirit of his looking at the country and that people who are particularly who've hiked in the country and been raised in the country and lived in the country and loved the country, their purchases keep the painter painting. So this show is really a celebration of the mutuality of, of uh, mutual love of country and, and the painter trying to, from his own craft of painting, from what he sees, to put down this mutual feeling toward the landscape. Uh, this one that uh, is put up here by Bob Dykus. Uh, I like the bare <laughs> slate of this shelf and the palette, the medium, the brushes, and I haven't read what he says about me there, but this was a field sketch made with Dick Smith, and we went up several times on Reyes Peak, and it represents the uh, Anacapa and the Santa Cruz Island from on the, almost to the top of the Reyes Peak, looking over the Chaparral country, of which uh, two condors that uh, Every day at about 11.15, Waldo Abbott told me to go up there and Dick Smith because two condors come over from the refuge, condor refuge, at 11.15 in the morning on a sunny day, so there's a thermal. And so this is the field sketch, and his daughter was along, and she made a watercolor there where the broken pine tree was. And then from this, we went up to about four by eight feet of a, the first uh, panel on which a bird painter uh, put in the condors. I had placed them, there were two of them, and I painted one out. So this is a field sketch. And uh, hopefully Dennis Powers would like to get the big one back from Oakland. It's never been shown up there, it's on storage. They, they decided to do the Oakland Museum with photographs. So. The painting really belongs in Santa Barbara. Now the other one on this side was a charcoal drawing up above the Hollister Main Ranch at the canyon. And it was a charcoal drawing and one day I decided I would paint it from memory. There's a wonderful bunch of oaks and a fault line that runs through there. And it, it for a time was part of the hundred paintings I did for the Santa Barbara Savings. Speaking of patronage, <laughs> that was a real commission. Uh, all the way from the Sacramento Delta, clean down through Santa Paula, Fillmore, uh, particularly uh, with Shafter, Stockton, Palo Alto. And for about eight or 10 years, I was given complete freedom to paint uh, and put up paintings. And if I went down to the area of the bank and thought the country there was more meaningful to the local citizens, they would let me put size and shape and frames to my own liking. And it was kind of a Guggenheim Fulbright <laughs> combined with a man by the name of Tony Vericio. And Mosher Art and Grant were the architects. And uh, one day I had some paintings put up there in the uh, architect's office. And they all came out and I said, are you happy with what I'm doing on your interiors? And they said, they're structurally, they're, they're just perfect for the banks of our architecture. So I felt what a harvest it was. Okay, I'm going to stop just a second. I think it's quite typical of the Hollister Ranch that against this movement of the watershed going this way, to have a counter movement of the formation of the clouds that promise another night of fog coming in, which accounts for a lot of the chaparral growth at a certain level. Okay, why don't we go to some more paintings now? Yeah, it's a, it's a fine bunch of landscapes out there. Okay. This one is an interesting 
subject because the shadow is of John Comer, who was painting the same rock outcrop. And the distant peak, of course, is uh, the lookout, far lookout, uh, at the head of the canyon that you see from Botanic Garden. But this is on the Aurora Burro trail that the Indians originally had going over the top of Cielo East. The sketch that's up here was of the, uh, at a noontime with uh, Kerry, the owner of the uh, Santa Cruz Island Ranch, the main ownership. And uh, they had martinis and uh, Chris Smith was along and they, they took a nap and I hiked down the uh, beach on the far side and got this volcanic rock. Uh, there was a yacht outside that came in and had permission to be there. He was very jealous of anybody coming out that he, they had to clear it with him before they could park their yachts and come, come ashore. And this one is a sketch that I made at St. Morris uh, between the lower lake and an upper lake. It's got a nice Swiss Alps uh, freshness of sketch in the fall. Late October. Okay. And then over on this wall is a painting that the uh, Dennis Powers bought from the museum, and it's called Condor Country. Uh, well, one second. Let me. And, and yeah. The thing to do that I was painting this with Dick Smith. He he hiked down to the Siskwalk, and uh, to check out some watering. Uh, springs for the Gertrude Reyes's cattle. Uh, but when I painted it on the spot, and I underpainted it with lots of the red earth tones that are in the, uh, of the earth under the chaparral, these group of clouds came up and the, 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 the pattern of them suggested the flight of the condors. So it's called condor country because it's just above the Sisquoc Falls and Big Pine where the condor on occasion nested and raised the next generation of condors. It's one of my very best paintings of the chaparral close values, but the solidity of the weight under the country is what I've always wanted to get, and this painting has it. The one next to it was, a red, was made for a, the Volbol, Elizabeth Volbol, is a great contralto singer, and she sings lots of songs, early Spanish, but ecology songs. And her son, who was 15 at the time, she went up on an oak above where the, she used to, as a girl, her father owned the Orello Ranch. And I made two paintings. One I gave to her mother, and this is the one that she bought as a commission. And in this exhibit, and on her walls are four or five of my paintings. <laughs> and her son, Eric, uh, who bought the first one to get oil out down on Delaguerre, where we had a cooperative gallery we started together. I, uh, he now owns nine or ten or more of my paintings and some of the very best paintings, particularly of the back country. I've, I kind of became a painter to a family. And I can't imagine anything more exciting as a painter to have this mutual feeling of spirit for place, a sense of place, a sense of light on the landscape itself, the earth. Wonderful, wonderful family. And this one is a result of working with Maynard Dixon on his final mural of of the Grand Canyon for the Santa Fe, as he said, to sell tickets out of Los Angeles <laughs> to the Grand Canyon. And I rubbed his back for him the day we finished it after four weeks of painting, the three of us. And he says, how do you make a living, Ray, just having one outlet in San Francisco? And I said, well, I don't. I pick up my carpenter tools and I'm a union carpenter and I, that's how I keep going. He said, well, stop at Cowie's at the Biltmore Hotel. They used to handle my work and you've got two or three paintings you made here while the 
mural was drying before we rolled it up, is show them to him and say, I sent you. And uh, so I did. And Cowie said, well, yes, I can see you're a fine landscape painter. And uh, I'm glad Maynard sent you. And uh, uh, let me have one or two of these. And uh, in a couple months, I'll let you know. And he did for a one-man show. And uh, so I said, I guess you want some red rock country, because it's Los Angeles. and." Uh, people from here go that direction and the warm color is very wonderful to live with. As Maynard Dixon said when he had to pay his monthly bills in San Francisco, which is so cold and foggy, he said he had painted another Canyon de Chez, red rock painting. It kept him going. So this painting was made a few months after I'd met Mr. Cowley. And luckily it didn't sell, but my father I gave it as a gift to my father, and uh, he uh, said there's no money that could take that painting away from him. He, he was building a house for my mother before he died, and uh, he would call in the sheetrock people, the plumber, and everybody else, and the local newspaper to see this painting because he says, it's, you're right there, it, 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 it's alive. <laughs> and it was the final winning over my father, because originally he wanted me to be a sign painter so I could make a living. And for the most part, he was correct. It's been a long pull with me doing certain things called dioramas, and let's go to those. Next. Well, Chris Smith and uh, Egmont Rhett and Waldo drove me up to see the Oso Marsh. It's named after the grizzly bears that used to live there. And now it's all built up with houses. But this is my field sketch. And uh, originally, it was bought by uh, Cliff Smith, part of his 15 paintings. But then Ellen wanted it. And uh, he wanted it, something else that was more meaningful to him, with more botany. And so uh, this one's owned by Ellen Easton, who has a, a whole armful of my paintings. And it's the Oso Marsh, and it's the working sketch for the diorama in the next room, which I hope you'll take a picture of also. And it's the volcanic cores on the way to Morro Rock. There are cores of volcanoes. I made a very careful one inch to a foot line drawing of every ridge, every canyon, every gully. And then on the third day, the fog came in, and as it pulled back, it gave me cloud shadows to model the foothills. And it turned out to be the uh, worth waiting for, because I'd gone back by myself and just slept with the subject. And uh, it's a fine diorama, but it's also a fine painting. Uh, how long did it take to do? Well, this one, I painted it on the final day in about four hours. But I had three days before of, of shaking hands in lineal drawing and shading up light and shade on it. so. It was a four-day job, but the actual painting you see here is about three and a half hours. Composition. Uh, I'm sorry, I turned it off. <laughs> so, so you said it took three or four hours, and what else? And 30 or, or 40 years before going up ridges and down canyons <laughs> and over foothills. Uh, would you like to see this one next, or, or should we shift to another diorama? Um, how about another diorama? I think so. Now, we, we skipped an a, a, um, aerial view, which was in the springtime, all in greens here. And uh, it's the main fault down the main ranch of, of uh, Santa Cruz Island. And it was in green, and there was a photograph that the Conservancy uh, lonely, and uh, I made it with dry season because I'd been over in, in uh, several times in the air, and I knew it, that the dry color, in contrast with the channel and the, and the far side of Santa Cruz, would make a more interesting uh, painting than putting green against the green of the water. So that's that one. Now on the one here on this side is a result of two trips up again with Waldo and Cliff and Rhett. 
And it was a very cold day when we went up and there was no snow on the original sketch. And I took little Kodachrome slides. Uh, I wanted to make a sketch, but they said, it's too cold, we're freezing. You can, you can, you can do it from the slides and uh, let's get off of here. Then after I made my pencil sketch uh, on one inch to a foot for the diorama, I said one day before <clears throat> scaling it up in the background, uh, let's go up there again when there's some snow so we can feel sorry for the single condor and, and get the snow patterns so that you feel identified with this bird that's facing extinction, which in a sense with the age we live in with the uh, atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb is what we all are on the edge of extinction. <laughs> and uh, so we went up a second trip and again we took color slides, no sketching from nature. So this whole background was painted from the two sets of slides. Oops, sir, there we are. I can walk, but I have two canes for safety's sake. But the way to look at paintings, and I've done it for the uh, painters in paradise, has been the uh, <laughs> fact that you can look at a, a whole group of paintings and down at below eye level, and you look up to these other paintings, and when you go to the art museum or into my own work, to, to, when I come up to my own paintings in here, I'm kind of in the position of either sitting in a stool and, my, and I, I'm back there, I'm back there. And with these 150 years of California paintings, you roll up to each one and you become the painter and you see what he did here, what he did there, how he got the away left and right implied. Wonderful way to see paintings in a museum. You don't get exhausted. <laughs> and uh, you become the co-painter. This is of the Volvo Ranch looking down to the sea. It's the Artego land grant, which included the whole Hollister area. But let's switch to another side over here. And over here, we're up in Marin County, part of the Golden Gate, Point Reyes National Seashore. And this was painted with 35 students watching me I projected a little color slide up and made a charcoal drawing and set it off and imagined I was back there. When you paint, and your life is a painter, you don't have to have an image in front of you. The best Innes' paintings were his last 10 years, painting out of a whole lifetime of landscapes. You re-breathe and get essences. This I was very honored to have. Excuse me, one moment. Okay, uh, Ray, Ray, what were you saying about this painting here? Well, I was going to say that this is of a, a stero that flows into the ocean. Uh, Drake's careening his ship is supposed to be there uh, a couple hundred years ago before that. This one was bought by Michael Drury, who became a, a painting friend of mine, and this happens to be Marin County also, and he saw it and wanted to buy it, and. He was working as a ranch hand out at Hollister, and he wanted to study with me. And I said, oh, you don't want to, after working all day, you don't want to come to a night class and a day class is when you're working. Just get me through the gate and we'll go painting together. But he saw this in the studio, and it's a place called Black's Mountain. And the thing that makes this a very interesting painting is the insistently growing trees following the watercourse both bays and oaks primarily, and they're like stepladders of, of this will to live. <laughs> the affirmation of the life force of these trees with this grass and oaks. Uh, it, it, it's so simple, it's powerful. Uh, the volume of the individual oaks, but the family of the oaks, like the families of the volbols on their support and by in my paintings, uh, here it is in one small little, I guess it's a two foot by, I don't know what it is, 2228. This is a quick sketch over in Assisi, which we stayed two weeks. 
with my daughter and my wife, and we almost froze to death. They didn't turn the heat on. They were saving money. But this was on one of the sketches looking down beyond the uh, town itself, which is wonderful. Tile roofs and stonework and the streets. Every place you looked, there was a composition that was trying to be painted and drawn. This is another painting that was, in this case, was bought by Mary Gosselin. And uh, it, in doing it, the main thing in composition was to have a, a gap so that you would leap from this gap to the updraft and the grove and the rhythm of the grove, the same patterns are talking in the clouds. And the clouds are forming off of the Halama Beach and the Pacific Ocean. And the rhythm of this uh, bean patch fallow land against the fresh new greens and the flow of the land like Brahms. Fine painting. It's enough in the small sketch you could go up two feet by four feet from it. The next one is an interesting painting and the caption tells you that after my wife's death from Panzer of the Cantrius, the same thing as Duke Sedgwick, my son went up with me with a paper bag, it's the size of a little shopping bag, of her ashes, and he climbed out on a ledge where the stream came down out of Palo Colorado Canyon and he sat in the stream on this rocky ledge and in the falling water, not on the land, but in the water that became the ocean shortly, is where Betty's ashes are. Uh, when I made this painting, Betty sat beside me. I was in a, in a uh, painting chair and it's the Big Sur country uh, down about eight or ten miles from Highlands Inn and it's one of my very best paintings the reason for the ashes being put here was that when she was 11, she had a girlfriend who was also 11, who was the daughter of Bailey Willis, the geologist, uh, later on emeritus. And I did a whole how mountains and plains are made with him advising me for a junior museum story of evolution for Palo Alto Children's Museum. But when she was here at 11, they would go down with a tent, with a wagon around just a dirt road, and go up Palo Alto, Palo Alto, Palo Colorado the Canyon. The fog would come in the afternoon, <clears throat> the redwood trees would drip, <clears throat> the two girls would hike up <clears throat> into the sun and pick huckleberries. So after her death, we put this painting in a president's show of the Santa Barbara Arts Association. I said, in memory of Elizabeth Rumsey Brown and Huckleberry Pancakes. And so that's the painting. <clears throat> when, Hank, when Hank Picture gave that talk, <laughs> he showed a slide to begin with of this. <clears throat> Let's just, uh, I got a frog. I'll get it out of the way. It's still hanging there. There. This particular painting is an enlargement in the studio of a painting almost two-thirds that size. It was my wife's favorite painting, and it was painted in 1936. Last Thursday, when Hank Pitcher gave the slide talk on, on Ray Strong, he uh, mentioned this particular painting that Betty was in it. <laughs> and his talk to begin with connected up uh, the lyrical feeling of the reclining nudity, as which is particularly that hill of Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> but within the coastal hills of California for 700 miles up and down, 
the lyrical grass-covered hills and the upbuilding of the of the mountains and the hills themselves with the erosion flowing down over it uh, creates a, a California landscape that is certainly very much anthropomorphic in its series of sculptural forms that relate to the human body of shoulders and breasts and buttocks and the, and the whole works. And so I was delighted to see him connect this up with the rescue of a female from a wrecked ship of Winslow Homer's and tying it in to the fact that one analysis of the painting is that the man who is getting her to the land from the stricken ship was really Mr. Homer himself. <laughs> Under the, he's not there in, in, except by implication of the painter visualizing the feeling of saving this life. And the interesting thing about it was that painting, and if we switch to this painting, was that the rescuing of human life from a strunk in a ship, that this painting was made just before I left New York. I saw the hook and ladder go under an elevated at First Avenue and 8th Street in New York. The foreground figures were a direct memory steal from uh, George Bellows of a have a group on the curbstone watching a horse rearing back in a blinding snowstorm against the tenement. When I first went to New York, I lived for the first fall into the winter on the top of this first building here. And I would paint the elevated from there. The elevated trains were right on a level of my bed, which was just a pad on the floor. And. Uh, the theme, of course, is the risking of the life of the man back here in the whole far service as a form of socialism, really, which was also originally the idea of the Coast Guard risked their lives to save people. And it was an in contrast to the whole uh, breakdown of the 1929 uh, stock market crash. And uh, I've just been going through a recounting of this thing for the, uh, the uh, West of the Rockies, uh, Smithsonian man who's had me talk about a job of, of the Bohemian Grove in San Francisco. And we cover this period of particularly uh, why it was that I became quite interested in the cooperative movement of the middle way of the Scottish and Sweden and Denmark. And so that, that's a good switch from love of life, and love of a wonderful wife, and the landscape, and this affirmation of the land. And this is kind of an affirmation of those people whose lives are in service in a way to uh, save lives. Uh, the whole thing was painted from uh, memory, of course, as a cop here. Motorman here, people up in front, and, and I made a pencil drawing to get this stuff in motion. I had to paint it in motion. Luckily, I don't have to paint too much detail. There's the people watching. The nicest touch in here is the burlicue, celebrating of the flesh, and the fleet's in. But I get a, an opposing triangular against the thrust. No, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to talk about this and to have it recorded. Ray, uh, <laughs> would you like some water? Well, it's a nice jump from that to the next sketch. And it's one that uh, Hank Pitcher and I think also Bob Dykus uh, like. It's just below the east entrance to Yellowstone National Park. And what I liked about the subject when I saw it was this yearly crop to take the cattle, which are the aftermath of the buffalo. They still have buffalo up there. And I, I like the feeling of the big, lumptious form of the weight of this, with the weight of the mountains, particularly the clouds, with the fall replenishing of the coming snowfall for the 
winter water supply for next spring, and the way the clouds would sneak up the canyons. I even like the fact that the, probably they had some wire around this to keep the cattle from getting in before they wanted to use the hay in the winter time. They probably put a plastic over it. The next one is where uh, I made this painting after Dick Smith's ashes were put in Lyons Canyon. That's named after the, the Puma, uh, the mountain lion. And Originally, Dick Smith took me in here and we stayed at a little line cabin for three days and he photographed and I painted. But this was painted after his death and this is one of the, uh, the Eric Volbol. I, I like the uh, rootings of the grass. I like the emphasis of the force of the vertical and the building toward it, and particularly this bite in here. It's Condor country, it's sacred country, the Chumash, and some of these rocks are pictographs of, uh, of the sun and the animals that live in the water. I've just had a drink of water, so I'm particularly interested in mentioning water. I had a frog in my throat. This is a nice theme, it's Pine Corral, and in behind me are, are the old dead fallen uh, pine trees in which the uh, pine beetles have finished them off. This one's still got some life in it. And what's the composition? Mainly it's a thrust and then the wind moving against it so that uh, rock weight cycle of life but new source of life. And it's a windswept part of uh, sacred Chumash country. And this was a print from the Heritage House in Marin, up in Sonoma County. I, they had been having Miller sheets and others just paint a single tree and I talked them into putting the trees with the environment that they grow in and this is the cove at Heritage House with the bishop pines. So that's the same pine tree that was found in the tar pits at La Brea, along with the mastodon and the saber-tooth taggers. Uh, this is a very accurate sketch of uh, where the San Andreas Fault goes right up to Molly's Bay in Marin County. It's one that I still own. There's a poet, uh, that, there's a doctor up there that uh, has written a book dedicated to both myself and my wife. Uh, he has one on Cathedral Hills dedicated to me. Uh, it's called Wild Harvest and it's, it is still to be uh, put in the bookstores here. They have a couple copies yet in the uh, bookstore here, but I think we'll put them in bookstores all throughout the town because he'll be coming down and he self-published it. These are little sketches each sketch was made on the spot in, Mil in Palo Alto, in the suburb, just east, southeast of town, and it represents the earth in space. But let's put it this way, this is Mon Monet's haystacks, but painted in the manner of 1850 to 1875, called the Luminous Movement, which included Winslow Homer, but it included uh, a whole group of painters concerned with the quality of light, particularly of the marshes in the east and seaboard, and uh, looking toward the ocean. And they were so concerned with the quality of light that they used a badger blender brush, and they would paint these very close values, usually uh, afternoon or morning or twilight. But this represents the rainbow constantly breaking over the earth. At noon in the Grand Canyon, everything is milked out, skim milk, because your shadows are down with the mice underneath the haycock. 
uh, in the morning or in the uh, afternoon, the shadows reveal the form and the rainbow goes in between the foreground and the distance, passing through yellow, orange to red to red violet, and eventually into a nightscape, which you paint the quality of blue-gray violet. And so this is an illustration of the Holy Grail that we live on, one planet or none, <laughs> from Mayfield. And when I was one year old, I slept through the 1906 earthquake. My father was getting a degree at Stanford. So that I should come back in 1941 and paint this series of landscapes, I was well aware <laughs> of uh, my own personal history. We'll pick this up again with another chart a little later. This is Ted Chamberlain's ranch. The best part about it is the mystery of what's inside of the barn. It's a painting in which the, the fourth dimension is implied. I think Ellen Easton loaned this one that's on consignment out at her place. The next one is a field sketch well, three or four hour job up on the shoulder of Mount Tamalpais. The primary thing for me is my association with the Douglas firs of Oregon. And here they are, here they are, here they're all up here climbing up and down. And it's a painting of the Golden Gate fog coming in. And that's why Drake never discovered the Golden Gate. He was socked in with fog from the Fairlands and he just went right on by it, didn't even know it existed. And the back country is the uh, sea cliffs, San Francisco, all the way down to Montalvo Head. And it's a, it's a very fine on the spot landscape. I often thought it'd be a great job for an artist to get the lookout job on Mount Tamalpais and between spotting any far that they might see <laughs> on the coastal from there to Bolinas to make innumerable pastels of the different fog effects and the cloud effects from Tamil Pies. I guess the next generation I have to do it. I, I never got up there, but this is the next best to go over halfway up. And I've painted this same subject several different times and also painted it to the west above Stinson. And this is a 10-day trip to Canada. And this is another sketch up in uh, the Volvo area. This one has sold already, so it's a nice commission for the uh, educational funding of the Natural History Museum. It was a hot noon. I'd been painting a commission for a ranch called the Willow, Willow Spring Ranch. And the ranch was named after the overflow from down of this great big willow. And it's kind of Renoir shit, so one of my best tree paintings I've ever made. But it was at the middle of the noon where I went in there to eat my uh, lunch, and I decided to make a painting of it. And this is up in the John Day country where the dry farming wheat fields are on top. If there was more going this way, you would see Mount Hood from the east side. <clears throat> the movie people took covered wagons and shot them being lowered down here. They, I don't think they tried to shoot them coming up the other side, but they made a movie of this particular John Day flowing into the Columbia River. And here we have a, a, a really a teaching chart from the Palo Alto Junior Museum. Uh, the rainbow occurs on foreground to distance, Monument Valley. And here's the rainbow broken through the Newton prism. And your painting, paint colors are yellow to orange to red to red violet to earth colors. And they go from white all the way down to the cast shadows from sunlight to the accents. And that's your tools. This is the earth and space with the phases of the moon. Here the thing goes from the uh, physics of light. Yellow is weak, it cuts out. You add orange, then you add red to your greens or whatever. You go through the violets and finally the sky takes over. There's a texture of things like uh, gravel 
and uh, scales on a fish and the texture of the organization of textures and the reflection of light is a painter's job in landscape painting. A ball, a sphere against a cube and a cone and a cylinder. And then you go to the color triangle of uh, the English uh, School of Landscape Painting and uh, opposites make mud, they make gray. Primaries make umber, make mud. <laughs> Your secondaries from orange in through all the earth colors, from sunlight to shadow, it's all here in the color triangle. And then here's a little account of the eight years we lasted with Doug Parshall, Joe Knowles, Jim Armstrong, and I are the only ones still alive, and John Gorham. And it, uh, for eight years, we thought we would have an art school in town, and actually with adult ed and the university, particularly City College, and all the individual artists that are doing continuing education didn't need another art school. It was kind of an attempt to re do the original one of the 30s that uh, Doug went to school and later taught in. There, I think we've just about covered the show, except for what Bob Dykus did here was to pick up this folder when I went back after 60 years of the Bohemian Grove mural of Van Sloan. And in there, he is quoted very accurately that the greatest thing in life was to be a landscape painter and to pass it on to the next generation, to, it's the Art Students League idea. That those who paint and enjoy the, what gifts they have and what disciplines they go through, that you have an obligation to see that the next generation <clears throat> has the learned tools that you have, which is about the only thing that you can pass across is drawing values, color values, composition awareness by looking at the whole history of landscape painting is hardly more than a thousand years old. <clears throat> so that with Maynard Dixon and working on his last mural and being a co-teacher and studying with uh, him in San Francisco is what this is about. And Bob put up these early sketches of where does the blue begin? <laughs> it's probably Mount uh, Hood and Douglas Furs through a whole range of blues. What blue? How much? how much green in the blue, how much violet in the blue. And these are sketches when I was uh, hiking above Timberline on Mount Hood and making these sketches of our camp, taking a certain peak on the mountain. And uh, I had a trip when I was 20 years of age, and this is a bunch of squaws grabbing you by the arm and dancing you until somebody gives some money to the mother of the squaw. It's a leap year celebration out of a meeting to psychologically you support somebody who's very ill and the mud dance so-called is the morning after the elderly women chant during the night to give support to the woman get well we're here to support you the mud dance they pick about an eight foot piece and put water in it and then they grab anybody that's grabbable and i had a beautiful cap <laughs> that the Forest Service wore that Jimmy said I should have to protect my skin. And I was in khakis, and I went. I was one of the first one. A couple of fellows on a horse, and the rest of them are stripped to the waist, and they take and dunk you, and all shows afterwards when you come out, you were covered with clay. This is the Grand Canyon that I made, which pretty accurate sketch. It's a watercolor at Tioga Pass. This is a sketch on the curb of one First Avenue and L, where the, we've covered that hook and ladder. These are sketches made by John Iverks. 25, over 25 years ago, he would come up to study with me, with Larry. And uh, this is Carlson Books on Landscape. There's never been a better book. And this is The Wild Harvest. This is the show down at the Art Museum. Some wonderful articles in here, particularly of Jean Rye. And then this is Larry's sketch of me some, on a location. These are the five basic forms for a group of women painters on Foothill Road. I made them in clay, and now we're taking that to the grade schools. 
and Skip and Larry, uh, particularly Skip and 97-year-old uh, Ed Hummerberg went to the third grade at Monroe School and then they make line drawings and they, the girls get inside of the swarms and draw it as if they're inside the cube or inside the ball, over the North Pole, around the equator. Wonderful way to pass on the Art Students League idea for these younger kids coming up in, uh, on Big River. And uh, this is of Cliff. The whole exhibit originally was to be just on celebrating Cliff Smith's 15 paintings. But he couldn't bear to part with him. He was going to give us two. He didn't even give us those. But we're up behind the big pine. And then this is a bunch of the oak group. And here we are with Arturo Tello, who hangs. He's the hangman for the show. And there's our 10-year celebration. That's about it. Elbows and plucks the strings by the name of Cowles. And it's a state park in his honor. And he went to New York and all around the world <clears throat> playing the piano <clears throat> as if it was a thunderstorm coming in. <laughs> Incredible. I don't know what they did to the piano after he finished a concert. I suppose they had to send it back to the piano tuner and retune it. <clears throat> I attended a couple of his uh, concerts with my wife and found them highly interesting. And, and during the WPA days, they put him on tape. I suppose a person could get it from the uh, archives of the WPA. He's long since gone. Well, do you want to take, take a look at a diorama or two or call it quits? <laughs> Go ahead. You were going to talk about these two here? No, yeah, these two. This one was bought by John Iwerks. He it was with me when I painted it. And it's of Douglas firs, but look how conditioned they are by the north wind all the way from the Arctic. The negatives are beautiful. It's called uh, Jug Handle Cove. I guess originally some of the people who worked at Fort Bragg would come down here with a great big jug of whiskey. and. Uh, <laughs> kind of forget the danger of cutting down trees and getting caught in the branches. Anyhow, that the, uh, my wife went down here with the dog and she picked up a piece of water-worn wood to throw for the dog to go into the surf, which the dog liked to do, a golden retriever. And it cut her, her palm of her hand, quite a bad, deep little cut. She came up to show it to me when I was finishing this sketch on the spot. There's some rather handsome volume painting in here with a light on the moss. Uh, it's, it's a fine painting. It would make a good reproduction to go on the market as a, uh, as a print. This one is where the high tide had left in these things coming down the coast off of the canyons. And of course the whole beach is uh, from the erosion from the sandstone. And that's where the fresh water goes back in to the ocean with Hope Ranch. So it's a nice composition, particularly this tie-in. And if, if we do go in and take a, 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 a video of the, uh, the big job, which is 8 by 34 feet, you can, Marsha Burt now goes out there and does wonderful compositions in acrylics of that whole theme of return to the sea. Tell me, what are you best at? <laughs> That's a heck of a question. Uh, I've, I've just been thinking here, what am I best at? Well, uh, in a general sense, considering the day that's outside today and the close values of envelopment, of the rain and the mist that's with the rain, and particularly like last yesterday afternoon, there are banks of clouds below the mountains. Uh, every place I looked, it was paintable. I, I'm best at painting uh, a, a envelopment of close values of fog and rain, and it's kind of logical as to my name of my mother, she was maiden name was Hillman, 
Ethel Hillman. So there must have been hillmen. So yes, I'm good at painting hills also. And I'm, I guess I paint hills better than I paint other things. Um, mountains, of course, are bigger hills. But if I, if I was to give an honest answer of what I am best at, I would say painting dioramas. Now that's not fine art painting, and one time Maynard Dixon wanted me to come over and join his third wife, Edith Hamlin, at Carson City because the poplars were turning gold and the cottonwoods, and, he, and I wrote back to him after he sent me a postcard, come on over. And uh, I said, I can't, I'm working on dioramas. And he wrote back and he said, hell, what have dioramas got to do with fine art? Well, there is the fine art of diorama painting. And uh, more often than not, by painting dioramas, if, if we go back to here's a kudu, well, that's 1956. But if we go back to 1935, uh, the fellow who did all of the African Hall, and his son particularly, had a commission to do five dioramas in honor of the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was one of the great things that Roosevelt, among other things, to get out of the Depression, did. And these were to do a far break, five by 20 odd feet long, of the Ponderosa far break, in which you paint the foreground, and the CCC boys were in sculpture, and then I painted the foothills of the Sierra to protect the Ponderosa Pine. And uh, after I did that in 1939, the university had a great big exhibit called Science in the Service of Man, and they had a big curve, like you put your arms around the exhibit, and they wanted to have paintings of 12 million years ago, 5 million years ago, 3 million years ago. One of them was of the Rancho La Brea tar pits. One of them was the black, of the Black Hawk group out, uh, beyond Walnut Creek, of where there were mastodons and camellias. And the inland sea or the Pacific was filled all the way to Bakersfield, and we did the duckbill dinosaur and the pleosaurus. And they had geologists, paleontologists, and paleobotanists. And I did these six dioramas with the sculpture one six scale. My gosh, what kind of a foundation was this in America for a landscape painter? I'm a landscape painter of substance and the fourth dimension of time and space and creation of the geology of the West of these commissions. So sure, my best paintings are due to the manager sending the sculpture down and the sculpture says, Ray, make a good price on them, at least 750 a diorama. And out of the 750 a diorama, my wife and I decided after 10 years to try to have a child and we had a son and she was pregnant going east on the Santa Fe and having the luxury of eating breakfast and lunch <laughs> and supper, watching the West roll by. And uh, of course, I, I went east to see the great WPA murals. Work pays America. Four times all of our, us kids voted for Roosevelt. Of course, it was World War II that got rid of unemployment at quite a cost. But we had to get rid of Hitler. Ray, Ray um, I have some other questions, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, we, you, you see, you ask a question, what is my favorite painting? Well, I, I would say fresh water going into the ocean, sandbars, the Pacific, and all of what's up there, including Conrad, Joseph Conrad. And the other things, and fall in love with the Palo Alto girl, daughter of a philosophy professor, getting her equivalent of a college education next to her room, and I was given a room when my brother got married. So out of philosophy, Stanford, <laughs> dioramas, and uh, then with John Iwerks, he built up the hurricane deck, 
quarter inch, 50 feet, Sisquok Manzano, and I hope you take a photograph of that to see his handiwork. And then I painted looking at it from the air and turned you into a condor, and he did too. We both painted the air, so you are raised 1,500 to 3,000 feet, and after you get through looking at the master taxidermy of the garbage collector, suddenly you are a condor. The Smithsonian sent a man out here and uh, he engineered that job. I do want to use Hank Picture's phrase here and now, a no sentimentality or nostalgia in what we've been looking at. Can you explain that? Well, in his talk, after he got pretty well into the talk of showing slides, some of them are not in the exhibit here, uh, he said that to him, as a young man, I think he was 11 or 12 when he came in, and I had an open door policy here, uh, that anybody could come in at any time and watch me paint and talk or see what was going on. And he said that to me one time, that seeing the light and the air and the country that he was raised in, that it was a very much a major impact on him to paint landscapes himself. <clears throat> All right. So, so to, to depart from what I just said about dioramas being my best, most disciplined work for its particular purpose, to have this show of here and now with the structural underpinning of what is underneath this landscape, with light and air and the particular subject on top, I, I couldn't have a better <laughs> going out to celebration of my life of this on top of what's down, which, which has been collected and put into the celebration of landscapes uh, in the art museum, of which I am a part. Well, what did you say the other day? You kind of felt like Tom Sawyer? Well, I said when I got up in front of the marvelous turnout of people that I felt like Tom Sawyer attending his own funeral because here I was being given the, the recognition and the bouquets and the meaning of what my wife kept me doing and people buying my paintings made it possible to realize what you see on the walls up here at the Natural History Museum. But to be, I felt like Tom Sawyer sitting in, having departed, being thought of as being quite a guy with Huck Finn, to hear it. And here I am alive, and here you are recording it, and I'm still celebrating for whatever it is worth. And I think it's worth quite a good deal. I, I kind of feel I'm half or a quarter or an eighth worth the attention you are now giving to me right here to do this partly honoring Bob's going out to the people and getting what they've committed, the American stepladder success of parting with whatever money it took to buy a series of paintings. Now they're getting quite expensive. And they were expensive to me when they bought them. I couldn't afford my own paintings what they paid for them. Luckily, Betty held on to some of them. <laughs>